Sometimes in life, you can look back and see why things happen. The reason things turn out the way they do. When I look back on my life and see the shape it has taken, I always come back to that summer a long, long time ago. Many things have changed since then, and I'll be the first to admit that all things considered, I've lived a most ordinary and uneventful life. But what happened that summer was not ordinary. As I remember, this summer began as any other. Baba and I friends. We did everything together. We were inseparable. Nothing could come between us. Yet we were very different. Not just the obvious ways, but in our natures. I was shy and thoughtful about things. Baba was full of charm and adventure. That particular summer, the holidays spread out before us like an endless map. Every moment seemed to be bursting with possibility. One day blurred into the next, marked only by the games we played and the things we did. There was so much to do. I was never at home. If Marva needed me for something, she'd call over the fence to Baba's house and usually find me there. Otherwise, she'd hear from Baba's mother that we'd gone off exploring or raiding fruit trees. Marva said I was a child of nature. And I suppose it was true. I was happiest in a tree or the warm sea, or lying in a field looking up at the clouds. Those days were happy ones. I remember feeling certain about many things. I felt certain that the world was good, that the world was safe, that we, Bubba and I, were invincible. Bubba collected shells. He mostly found them on the beach, washed up by the tide, covered in sea stuff. He took great care to clean each one. He scrubbed up the outside with a wire brush and polished up the mouth with a soft cloth until it gleamed. It was a private thing which I understood. Sometimes Baba was there for a long time underneath his house with the shells laid out, arranging them thoughtfully. What will you do with him? I asked him one day when I saw how his collection had grown. He said he would like to make things from them, but he didn't know how. Me, I collected feathers. I had yellow ones from corn birds, bright blue ones from macaws. I had feathers from the hawks that circled above my house. For me, my feathers were symbols. Every feather I found was a sign or a message telling me to watch out. Something was about to happen. I imagined the birds scanning everything from above. I envied them. If I found a shell, I gave it to Baba. If Baba found a feather, he gave it to me. We had a partnership. The first time I saw Charlie Sand, we were on our way down to the river. We rarely caught anything, and even when we did, there was nothing we caught that could ever compare with the fish Charlie Sand was carrying. He passed me and Baba without a glance, without a word, as if we were trees or bushes. Baba talked about that fish for the whole day. Two days later, down at the beach, we gave up looking for shells and decided to play some cricket. I remember we were heading for the far end of the bay when the sound came. I'd never heard anything quite like it. It sounded soulful and important somehow, like a kind of fanfare. Charlie Sand was calling to something. It could have been the sea or the wind or the moon. All I knew was that 
Bubba fell under his spell. Later that day, I got this feeling that things were about to change. Something was in the air, something I couldn't quite understand. Whatever it was, I knew one thing for sure. The feathers never lied. Walking over to Bubba's house, I noticed my feet were feeling unusually heavy. Charlie Sand had been there all afternoon. Apparently, Bubba had shown him his collection and Charlie had picked out the biggest and best shell and said he'd turn it into a lap. He brought his tools. He never went anywhere without his tools and set about making it happen. I wanted to ask him questions like, where was he from and how long was he staying? How old was he? But I couldn't. I felt awkward and I was hurting. There was no real reason to feel this way, but I did. Then came the moment and I hoped the lamp wouldn't work. But it did. Charlie San had many talents. Baba said he could do anything. Juggle, skate, make boats, float, walk on stilts. The list went on and on. I told Baba I would make my own assessment. Charlie built the treehouse in a day. And I hated to admit it, but I was impressed. Baba could be the watchman, Charlie said. From up there they could see the world. From up there they could spot any intruders. I felt as though they met me. Next, Charlie decided to make wings. He said he and Bubba were going to fly. I laughed at first, but something told me he was serious. He said the angle and balance of the brace was crucial and the weight of the wings would determine elevation. Charlie Sand used words like elevation. By the time he'd finished, I didn't know if the wings would work. But I liked them and wished they were mine. I tried to keep Charlie interested in me by telling him all my best stories. The stories came from my father who had traveled to faraway lands. They were running out and I was about to make one up when I caught myself. I caught myself just in time. I realized something really important. That I wasn't about to pretend or lie or be anything but myself. And if I did have to change for Charlie Sand or for Bubba, then I would become a panther and chase Charlie back to where he'd come from. Big black cat would run him out of town. <laughs> For three long weeks, I kept away from them. Mostly, I hung around the house and quarreled with my sister. I knew Marva was concerned because I'd never been this way before. She tried to cheer me up with meals she knew I liked, but nothing worked. And Molly was suddenly impossible. She took my books and best toys and refused to give them back until I told her what was wrong. I said she could keep them for all I cared. I wouldn't tell her for the world. It was as though everything was closing in and all the color had gone. I lost my appetite for food, my appetite for life. I walked and walked. On my way home from one such walk, I saw something gleaming in the grass. The ball belonged to Charlie Sand. I wish I'd never seen it, but it was too late. The distance between me and them felt like a whole country. It was the longest walk I'd ever walked. But I knew it was necessary. I had to give them one last chance. I should have known better. If they hadn't bothered with me for three weeks, why should they bother with me now? 
of it like a post or a bush or, or a tree. I wanted to go to their tree house and mash it up. Never again, I said to myself, never again. Marva, it turned out, had also had enough. She had enough of my sulking and my long face. She told me to go and do something useful. Fill up the basket with mangoes, she said. And don't come back until you're done. Well, I could have burst. Everyone and everything was against me. How could everything go so wrong? I'd lost my best friend. I had no one to talk to. Marva was angry. And now I had to pick fruit for a stupid jam? No way, I said. No way. I knew the higher branches were forbidden, but I didn't care. At least up there I could be alone. I looked out at the world. I remembered Baba telling me that when God cried, the rains came. That when God slept, the sky turned black. That when God breathed, the wind blew. All I knew was, if I were God, the land would flood, and the winds would howl, and the world would be in darkness. Where was God when I needed him? That was when I saw her. I can't say how long I lay in her arms. It felt like an eternity. Marva told me later that she'd called out, but I never heard a thing. I just kept looking at her. The air smelled of roses. When she kissed me, it was as though she was saying, Bless you. Bless you. Marva brought me quickly back into the world. She was scared and probably feeling guilty for sending me out to pick the fruit in the first place. For three days she pampered me. She insisted I stay at home where she could keep an eye on me. I didn't tell Marva I was fine, but I was. I felt better than I'd felt in a long time. I felt differently about things. The pain was gone. I wasn't angry with Bubba and Charlie Sand anymore. I knew if Bubba was really my friend, he would come back. And if he didn't, then he wasn't my friend in the first place, and it was okay. But more importantly, who was she? Why me? What was she trying to tell me? I found an interpretation of the vision I had seen in an old text. It said, Angel, a divine messenger, a ministering or attendant spirit. On the third day, Baba arrived. He said he'd heard a rumor that I'd fallen from the tree and landed standing upright. He wanted to know if I could show him how I'd done it. Looking up at the tree, I felt a twinge of doubt. Impossible, I thought. It, it's too high, too far. Then I saw them. They could only have come from one place. Baba thought there was something else. Your, your collection, he said. Charlie Sand? Well, I felt like he'd learned something, too. Maybe that there's more to life than inventing things. And I realized that in his own way, Charlie Sand had been a blessing. If it hadn't been for him, I might never have met her. Since then, she's never left me. My life has been mostly ordinary and uneventful, as I said. But when things have been hard, harder sometimes than I thought I could bear, I've thought about her. And in a strange way, things haven't seemed as bad.
What was a message? Why me? I'm just an ordinary man. Sometimes I think I won't ever know the answers to such questions. If it weren't for the feathers, I would think I'd imagined the whole thing.